Hello, my name is Tim Smith. I'm a headache specialist and researcher from St. Louis, Missouri, and I'm uh, the chair of the CAQ Committee for the National Headache Foundation. I'm going to talk to you for the next half hour or so about the acute therapy of migraine. Uh, this is a topic that uh, is uh, not only important for this examination, but it's extremely important for the care of patients in your clinics, and I hope you get a lot out of the uh, discussion. I usually like to start talking about uh, the domains of migraine control and you can see that we think there are four different domains, the abortive or what we might call as the reversal of uh, migraine domain and then preventive care, rescue care, and then treatment of non-pain symptoms. And it's my assertion for this talk that uh, the reversal or abortive care is probably the most important thing that you can do for a patient. If a patient has good prophylactic therapy, but they're still having some migraines, they still have to be able to turn them off with an abortive uh, uh, agent and, uh, or a reversal agent. So we're going to go over those today, make sure you have a good uh, foundation of what those abortive therapies are and how they should be used. And uh, the concepts that we're going to cover today include the bullets that you see on this slide. Is we want to cover the use of the migraine-specific uh, migraine-specific therapies and let, make sure you understand which ones those are and how they work and and uh, how to use them. Uh, we want to use them in a patient-centered fashion and stratified care. We'll talk a little more about what that means. We want to talk about early intervention uh, to try to maximize the effectiveness of the medications we use. And we want to understand how central sensitization works and how this may impact uh, the medications you choose and also uh, what the expectations around the, those medications might be. And then lastly, we'll have a word on preventing transformed migraine. So when we talk about pharmacologic man management, and that's the essence of this talk, uh, we refer to nonspecific and specific treatments or migraine-specific therapies. In the nonspecific uh, therapy realm, we're talking about uh, nonsteroidal anti-inflammatories or combination analgesics, uh, some of which are over the counter, and then uh, narcotic medications and antiemetics. For specific therapies, we're mainly talking about the triptans nowadays, although there are a couple of other uh, uh, products out there. The isometheptine compound that was previously marketed under the brand name of Midrin, some of you may recognize. Uh, and it's been on the market and off the market uh, depending on uh, uh, local supplies, etc. And then the ergot and related, de uh, related derivatives, mainly uh, DHE is the one that's most uh, commonly used nowadays. And so we'll go over all of these. But starting with the uh, over-the-counter drugs, um, there are some approved treatments, acute treatments for migraine over-the-counter. And according to the FDA, to get an OTC drug approved, uh, they have to have these qualities that, they, uh, number one, they can be used by customers, uh, by consumers for self-diagnosed ailments. They, the benefits must outweigh the, the risks and they have to be able to be appropriately labeled for correct use. Uh, the potential for misuse and abuse has to be low and uh, it, this requirement that physicians or other health practitioners aren't necessary for people to safely and effectively use them. And when we look at the ones that are approved for migraine use uh, in the United States. There's the Excedrin migraine, uh, was the first over-the-counter drug approved by the FDA in 1998, and then the uh, uh, ibuprofen brands, which are Advil and Motrin, and there are generics of these out there. And those were approved in 2000. There were controlled trials that were done to show that these medications were safe and effective for migraine. The trial criteria for these were a little different than those we used for the uh, uh, migraine specific drugs and we'll come back to that a little bit later uh, but uh, suffice it to say that uh, the clinical trial requirements for the uh, over-the-counter products uh, required that the patients not be uh, disabled uh, frequently and not have uh, nausea and vomiting with their headaches more than 20 uh, 25 percent of the time so they selected for a milder uh, set of migraine patients but these medications work perfectly well as we all know, if they're overused, they can lead to medication overuse headache, and that's the thing that we have to be on guard uh, for uh, with our patients to make sure that they are not uh, taking these medications more than a couple of days per week uh, to avoid medication overuse headache. So if we look at the recommendations for migraine management, uh, we turn to the U.S. Headache Consortium guidelines 
and <clears throat> they recommend that uh, migraine specific agents uh, should be used uh, as a first line of treatment, especially in patients that have moderate or severe headache, and uh, this is, we're going to come back to that concept of stratified care, and then also in patients who haven't responded to entry-level things like non-steroidal anti-inflammatories and combination medications. Other recommendations are that uh, uh, clinicians select a non-oral route of administration, and we've got some options there, we'll come back to it, but we do that especially for severe uh, nausea or vomiting or uh, where oral medications fail. And then we also want to consider a self-administered rescue medication for severe migraine that fails to respond to other treatments. So if a patient's taken reasonable anti-migraine therapies then, uh, and it's not working, then it's, uh, it's smart medicine to think about backup things to do, sedatives, or in some cases even uh, an, uh, narcotic analgesics for rescue only for infrequent use. And then uh, to give the patient plenty of uh, instruction on uh, guidelines around uh, guarding against medication overuse uh, headache. So let's look a little closer at the prescription treatments. Uh, there's, uh, we'll start with the nonsteroidal anti-inflammatories. Ibuprofen is obviously OTC also, but can be prescribed, and there are others. These are the ones that have uh, FDA approval. Uh, there is a, a, um, a uh, prescription product uh, called Cambia is the brand name. Uh, it's a diclofenac and it comes in, a, in an oral slurry or, or a mixture that uh, puts it into solution. Uh, and the reason for that is to try to make, uh, make it work faster. And it's been studied and had uh, robust data. This is some pharmacokinetic data here that shows uh, that uh, the um, uh, diclofenac in the oral solution does indeed get absorbed into the, um, into the bloodstream much faster and the patients have a better outcome. This is the pharmacokinetic slide and then when we look at the outcomes uh, and you can see the top green bar there indicates that the onset of analgesic effect in migraine when using the oral solution product uh, is about 15 minutes as opposed to about an hour for taking the oral product. Uh, and I'll say that uh, this becomes important when we're trying to beat the clock, when we're trying to get that early treatment and try to beat uh, migraine before central sensitization sets in, and we'll come back to that concept a little bit later. But let's review the triptans because this is the uh, sort of gold standard of class of drugs for uh, acute migraine management, and as you can see, uh, there are going to be several of those, and, and uh, uh, we're going to talk about sumatriptan first, which is the first triptan marketed in this country. It was marketed around 1993 as an injectable drug, and then uh, in 95 as an oral drug, and then in 97 as a nasal spray, and then there have been some other uh, additions, uh, new uh, dosing uh, mechanisms, and I want to go over those so that you will know them. Um, but uh, the, we have them listed here, the subcutaneous 6 milligram, 4 milligram, comes with an auto, -inject, auto injector, and uh, then there are tablets, 25, 50, and 100 milligram tablets and nasal spray, and a 5 and 20 milligram nasal sprays. Uh, Needle-free injection has been marketed under the brand name of Sumavel, um, and I'll show you that. Uh, there's also a new transcutaneous iontophoretic patch, uh, which delivers the medication across the skin, and uh, I'm going to show you that one as well. Uh, there is a sumatriptan to proxin combination, uh, which is a, a novel uh, combination product, uh, and it's uh, marketed under the brand name of Treximet. Uh, and then there's an intranasal powder, uh, which is being administered as a, as a sort of a breath-powered device, uh, and it's just recently, as of maybe a couple of weeks ago, uh, uh, um, or in uh, January, February of uh, 2016, was approved by the FDA and is marketed now and I'll show you that one as well. Uh, but all of these are sumatriptan, it's the same medication, these products are designed to give you different options, different ways of delivering the medication to the bloodstream, uh, and uh, obviously the subcutaneous injection gives you the fastest onset uh, and is probably the uh, most powerful anti-migraine treatment that we have in the acute setting. Uh, it has been uh, for the last uh, 20, uh, three years. Um, uh, the, but uh, uh, 
people want to be able to swallow tablets. It's just easier to handle. It's more discreet. And uh, so the tablet is always going to be the, the, the entry level dose. But it's good to have some other non uh, oral formulations. And remember, the guidelines suggested that you select a non oral route if patients have excessive nausea and vomiting or if they don't get uh, results from orally de delivered drugs. Uh, so if we look at these, this is uh, just a slide that shows the Sumavel Dose Pro. Uh, it's a, it's a, a needle-free injectable. It uses a, a pressurized glass canister with a nitrogen-filled um, uh, uh, pressure uh, um, um, compression chamber uh, that when activated uh, forces a stream of liquid out of the glass uh, canister with a, through a pore that pierces the skin and deposits the medication under the skin. And they have uh, pharmacokinetic data showing that this uh, gets the medication in the bloodstream uh, uh, in an um, almost identical way as, to the, uh, as compared to the subcutaneous injection. And uh, it's pretty easy to use. You snap the top off of it, you flip a lever, and then you push it uh, down against the skin and then it's activated. Uh, by the uh, by, by the pressure itself, uh, so this gives patients uh, uh, a more uh, uh, efficient and uh, accurate delivery. There are less uh, dosing mistakes with it, and uh, there there are no needles to be disposed of. The security patch is uh, 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 this iontophoretic patch, and you can see this uh, is a picture of someone wearing one. There's a medication patch on one side and a conduction uh, patch, and, and there's a little watch battery-like uh, uh, power source in the middle. And when it's activated, it creates a very small uh, electrical current uh, through the skin and carries the medication out of the patch into the bloodstream, and they get good uh, pharmaco pharmacokinetic levels of semitriptan in the bloodstream, and it works. It gives another way of delivering the, blood, the uh, medication to the bloodstream besides an injection or an intranasal uh, administration. And then uh, the newest one is this uh, um, uh, or a nasal delivery uh, mechanism of, uh, of, a, of a semitriptan powder. Um, this is not a nasal spray per se. This device uh, is, uh, has a, a powdered version of the uh, sumatriptan in it. Uh, one of the uh, uh, ends of the receptacle goes in the nose, the other goes in the mouth, and instead of spraying and sniffing, the patient just blows into the device, into the device, and the powder is delivered into the nose in a dose that's uh, reproducible and gives the desired effect, and it works well. It's just that, just marketed in early 2016. That's the sumatriptan uh, versions. Let's go over the other triptans. Six of them. Uh, first of all, there's somatriptan marketed under the brand name of Zomig. It's marketed in a two and a half and five milligram tablet, and it's also marketed in what we call an orally disintegrating tablet, same dosages, and they also have a nasal spray version. One thing I always tell people about Zolmatriptan is that uh, the orally disintegrating tablet does dissolve in the mouth, but the content, the, the medicine still has to be swallowed. So uh, it's, not, uh, it's not a transmucosally absorbed uh, product in the mouth, under the tongue, or in the jaw. Uh, then there's uh, Narotriptan, marketed under the brand name of Emerge. Comes in one and two and a half milligram tablets. Works quite well. It has a little longer half-life, about 12 hours, and it's been used in some uh, uh, many prophylaxis schemes for menstrual periods. Uh, there's data to support doing that. Uh, there is uh, Rizotriptan, which is marketed under the brand name Maxalt, and this one also has a uh, 5 and 10 milligram tablets, but it uh, also has an orally disintegrating tablet as well. Uh, this orally disintegrating tablet is a little different from the Zolmatriptan orally disintegrating tablet in that the Rizotriptan is, a, is kind of a wafer uh, that's uh, soft and spongy, does absorb, absorb, absorb moisture very quickly, so uh, we always tell patients if they tell us they take it out of the blister pack they need to go ahead and use it quickly because if they hold it between their the fingers for very long, just the skin moisture starts to dissolve it, and then they wind up with goo stuck on their fingers instead of uh, a tablet to swallow. Uh, and this one also does not get absorbed across the mucosal surfaces of the mouth, has to be swallowed down. 
Uh, importantly on rhizotriptan, it is uh, uh, metabolized by monoamine oxidase A, which is the primary metabolic pathway for propranolol, the only beta blocker that's uh, metabolized by monoamine oxidase A, but propranolol is also used frequently as a migraine prophylaxis agent. So if patients are taking propranolol, you should use a reduced dose of rhizotriptan, and that would be the five milligram dose instead. Moving on to the other triptans, we have albotriptan, which is marketed as uh, Axert, um, and it comes in six and a quarter and 12 and a half milligram tablets, uh, also recently approved to treat adolescents uh, um, by the FDA. Uh, there's Frovatriptan, which only comes in two and a half milligram tablets. It has the distinction of having a 26 hour half-life, which may be important for patients who have uh, recurrence of headache uh, after using the shorter acting drugs. It can also be used as many prophylaxis uh, during predictable headaches such as menstrual migraines. Uh, then there's uh, elotriptan or Relpax, uh, the last one to be marketed and it uh, comes in uh, uh, 40 milligram tablets, also comes in a 20 but uh, the 40 is the one that's usually used. Uh, it it's, uh, has a high bioavailability but it's, uh, it's it is metabolized by cytochrome P453A4 isoenzyme, and so you have to be careful with macrolide antibiotics and antifungal agents and some antiarrhythmic agents uh, with this one. But it's quite good. Uh, they all work. So those are the triptans. Now we want to talk a little bit about the ergot derivatives, and primarily uh, DHE45 is the one that we uh, uh, recommend. Uh, it is a modified version of ergotamine. It's been around since 1945, and that's why it's called DHE45. <clears throat> it's available as an injection, uh, which can be given uh, IV, IM, or subcutaneously. And then it's also marketed as the nasal spray under the brand name of Migranol. There's no oral use, uh, dosage, usable, uh, dosage available in the United States, and there are some uh, inhaled versions under study. Um, but yet to be approved by the, uh, uh, by the FDA. And uh, this is a puffer, not a, not a nasal spray. It's a, it's a pulmonary inhaler uh, that delivers the medication to the bloodstream very quickly. The nasal spray dose is the one that's most commonly used now and as an abortive agent uh, because patients can use it easily at home. It's a two milligram dose. Uh, and uh, a lot of uh, studies have suggested that uh, DHE is a good product to use when rebound headaches are suspected and you can use this in patients uh, to reduce the liability of just uh, becoming getting a rebound or a medication overuse headache to a different different product. Ergotamine tartrate is still around. Uh, the one milligram uh, tablets, capsules, sublingual forms are frequently marketed in combination with caffeine. Uh, they're relatively inexpensive, however, you do have a risk of ergotism and the risk of uh, medication overuse headache is very strong so these are not used very much uh, and it's primarily relegated to uh, headache clinics and uh, places that know which patient populations to select and how to prescribe. So those are the, medic the, the uh, migraine specific products that we wanted to cover, the triptans and the ergots primarily, uh, the uh, non-steroidals that were approved as well. Uh, but let's talk about how to use them now. We, we want to uh, talk about this concept of patient-centered stratified care. And so when we look at uh, treatment schemes, we, we, there are basically three different uh, modes or schemes that we can use. We can use what we call step care across attacks, step care within attacks, and then stratified care. And I'm going to go over each, each of those three. Step care across attacks is where you give a patient um, uh, treatment to uh, treat a series of attacks and then have them contact you or return uh, to reevaluate. And, and as this uh, uh, graphic depicts, uh, if there's success, then the patient sticks with treatment, treatment one. And if it doesn't work, they can either come back uh, for, uh, to see you and get treatment two, or some of them may be lost to care. And the same for attack series three. If, if, if the patient gets a good treatment from attack series two, uh, then they get success, then they'll stick with that treatment. If not, they need to come back for yet a third uh, 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 prescribing session. And each time you lose some to care, and this is a long, sort of drawn out, painstaking way to deliver it, 
and we usually don't do this uh, just because it's so inefficient. Um, step care within a tax is where you give a patient two treatments and you have them treat with treatment number one for every headache and then if it doesn't uh, work then they go to treatment two and then so on and so forth and so if they get good successful results from treatment one they can return to normal activities uh, but if they um, don't then they can go they have more than one product at their disposal with, and they can give be given instructions on how to use those in that fashion uh, and this is uh, uh, commonly used and, and for many patients is not a bad way to um, to recommend therapy uh, but as you can see also there uh, for each failure there can be an opportunity for patients to be lost to follow up or or to bail off of you know and, and, and get out of the treatment scheme uh, which um, it may, may not be uh, uh, wise and it also may interfere your ability to uh, continue to um, uh, assess their outcomes. The lastly, uh, last the third mode we want to talk about is stratified care, and this is where you try to determine the patient's likelihood of success. Um, uh, a forethought. So, and this is usually done through a disability assessment. Um, in this uh, schematic, uh, the, the MIDAS questionnaire is used. This is a well-established migraine disability assessment uh, uh, questionnaire that the patient can self-complete. And uh, so, for example, you can, you can administer a, a disability questionnaire like the MIDAS and then stratify the patients based on their needs. So if they have a really uh, low MIDAS score or low disability, then those patients can uh, use uh, a, a lower end uh, treatment perhaps and then if, if they have a higher degree of disability then you would escalate to a higher uh, uh, efficacy uh, product and then uh, and, and so on and so forth and so in the um, I wanted to show you the results of the study um, we can go, and this is uh, the results of a study called the DISC trial and uh, many centers around the United States uh, participated in this uh, in the uh, research on the DISC study was sponsored by AstraZeneca uh, to look at um, using different schemes for treatment. So it's not a study of a particular drug so much as it is a study of different ways of using them. And in the study, if you look at this uh, diagram, it shows that there were three study groups uh, and they randomized patients into the study, schema into, uh, study groups. Uh, one group that treated uh, by step care across attacks, which we reviewed, and then step care within attacks was the second group, and then the last group was uh, treated with with stratified care. Uh, and it, <clears throat> for the patients that were randomized to the step care across attacks group, they were given one treatment to treat a series of three attacks, and then they came back to the clinic for a second visit, and then they were given a second treatment uh, based on how they responded to the first series of treatments. Uh, and the, the entry level treatment was a combination of aspirin, uh, aspirin and metoclopramide, uh, which is on this uh, uh, diagram, it says A plus M, that means the aspirin and metoclopramide combination. And then uh, they were, all, all patients in this group were given a, uh, aspirin plus metoclopramide at the first uh, three visits uh, for the first three attacks. And then they came back through and uh, they had, uh, their diaries were reviewed and if they weren't getting good care, uh, from those good relief from their attack, then they switched to uh, a zomatriptan or zomic. Um, in the second group, it was step care within attacks, and uh, these patients were treated a series of six headaches, and they were given both the as aspirin and metoclopramide and zomic, and they were instructed treat every one of your headaches with aspirin and, metoclo and metoclopramide, and after two hours, if you're not getting better, then you rescue with the zomatriptan. And then in the last care uh, group was the stratified care group. And these patients were, had, uh, were um, randomized to treatment uh, based on uh, their MIDAS scores. And, uh, and we'll come back to that. But they were given either aspirin and metoclopramide or zolotriptan based on their degree of disability. And uh, they were really stratified to one treatment or the other. And when we look at the results, if we look at, uh, first of all, a comparison between stratified care and step care across attacks, and the point we're going to make here is that stratified care is the best way to go. But if you look at stratified care versus step care across attack, 
you can see that uh, um, there was uh, that the uh, stratified care was superior to the step care arm uh, at uh, um, for all attacks. Uh, but if you look at the difference between the first three attacks and the second three attacks, and remember these were patients who were given uh, aspirin and metoclopramide. Uh, in the step care uh, group and they had to use that for three headaches and then come back and then adjust and if you look at those the first three attacks the uh, stratified care arm was much better uh, than the uh, than the uh, step care across attacks arm and that's that middle uh, comparison there and then if you but if you look at the four to six attack range this is uh, basically, the advantage goes away. So, by doing what this is saying is that by doing stratified care, you're more likely to give the accurate and best treatment the first time you see the patient. Um, and then, if you looked at the stratified care within the step care within attacks, so these are patients uh, you're comparing stratified care, giving the patient medication predicated on their disability scores or disability assessments, compared to patients who were given. Uh, two different treatments, an entry-level treatment and then a, uh, a more migraine-specific treatment with the instructions to treat with uh, the aspirin and metoclopramide first and then uh, take the zolotriptan in two hours if you're not getting better. And so if you look at that, uh, within the first hour and two hour time points, the stratified care in point, uh, population does much better, statistically significantly better than the uh, step care within a tax group. Now the advantage goes away after four hours because patients have had a chance to rescue or to take a backup medication if they're not improving. Uh, but this just goes to show that the stratified care is the best way to go with step care within attacks being a useful uh, second approach for some patients. And these are just the results showing that disability uh, scores can predict uh, the treatment uh, that's most, most likely to be effective and that uh, stratified care is more effective than other step care strategies. Now let's talk about early intervention because uh, one of the things we think is very important is that for migraine acute care, early intervention is an important uh, uh, concept. And this means treating the patient during mild, the mild phase of the migraine in patients who typically experience moderate to severe pain. And so when we look at the migraine curve, the phases of the attack, we see that uh, the patients uh, start sometimes with some pre-headache symptoms such as a prodrome and aura, then they go through a mild phase that's in between, progress on if untreated, uh, many times will pro progress on to moderate and severe headaches, and then uh, resolve over time with some postdrome symptoms that uh, may continue to occur. And what we want to do is catch people in that mild phase if we can, because the studies show that if you treat during that phase, you're much more likely to get a complete response. And I'm going to show you what I mean by that. So, uh, but we're going to talk about central sensitization because I think this is one of the key concepts that uh, predicts uh, and explains the early intervention success. Uh, it's because when the pain's not treated early, it may become more refractory due to the development of central sensitization. So what is central sensitization? Central sensitization is a phenomenon that's characterized by the development of cutaneous uh, allodynia, which is a uh, uh, sensation of pain um, even to non-painful stimuli. And essentially what's going on is when the patient experiences repetitive pain signaling uh, from uh, the peripheral nociceptors over time, uh, this leads to activation of higher order neurons that propagate the pain response whether there's a pain stimulus there or not and these sensitized higher order neurons continue that pain transmission over time even if the nociceptive uh, input ceases. Let's look, I'm going to show you a graphic here that uh, looks at the brain stem and uh, the brain itself and uh, this shows, shows us where these uh, first, second, and third order neurons are and as you can see um, the first order neuron is in the trigeminal ganglion and these are where the uh, uh, trigeminal fibers, the uh, uh, sensory fibers uh, from the face and, and scalp and, and from the deeper structures in the dura and the perivascular uh, innervations in the, uh, that course through the brain and around the brain, those are all innervated by the trigeminal nerve and these, uh, these nerve cell bodies are in the, in the trigeminal ganglion. 
and then they send a central projection into the brain stem and it snaps is with second order neurons in the trigeminal nucleus caudalis, which is the, the brain stem representation of the dorsal horn, the sensory uh, um, nuclei for the, for the spine and, and, uh, and caudally into the brain stem for the trigeminal uh, nerve. And then those uh, uh, neurons send projections centrally that synapse to third order neurons in the thalamus <coughs> and then they send their projections onto the cortex where pain is, is uh, produced. So there's the peripheral uh, um, neurons in the trigeminal uh, nucleus uh, and then uh, in the trigeminal ganglius and then the central uh, second and thir third order neurons in the, in the, nucleus, the trigeminal nucleus caudalis and the thalamus. And uh, those second and third order neurons are the ones that become sensitized over time and uh, start to uh, um, sit, can propagate continued pain impulses to the cortex, uh, whether, there's, whether there continues to be a, a peripheral uh, source for that or not. And the time course looks like this. So the first order neurons are uh, sending this pain impulse to, uh, from those uh, perivascular spaces, from the trigeminal nerves to the brain. In the early uh, first few minutes, especially for migraine attacks, and uh, that's a, a peripheral neuronal sensitization and tri trigeminal ganglion. This gives a throbbing pain. If it goes on unchecked, then the second order neurons will start to become sensitized over time. And these are the ones in the trigeminal nucleus caudalis. And over about an hour or more, those patients will start to develop central sensitization and they'll have ipsilateral allodynia. So on the same side as the migraine attack, they will have uh, a, a pain, sensitive, pain sensitivity so that if they uh, uh, brush their hair or uh, wear a ball cap or glasses, then they will um, uh, develop uh, pain sensitivity uh, to those uh, non-painful uh, stimuli. And if that goes on, then the third order neurons become activated uh, or sensitized, and uh, this this cause is a, these are the nuclei in the thalamus, and uh, this can give you contralateral allodynia, so that the patient would just becomes painful from from just about anything, and that takes two to four hours to develop. <clears throat> so what you can see is, if it's a race against central sensitization, you want to try to get those those headaches treated in that first hour if you can, especially if the pain is still mild. So how does it look in studies? So uh, this was a study conducted by Roger Cady and others and looked at some retrospective analysis of, of uh, clinical trial data and showing that patients who treated when their headache was very mild uh, had a much stronger response. And you can see at the four hour time point, patients who treated when their headache was mild, about 85% of them were pain free as opposed to those who waited, and they were only about 48, a little less than 50% uh, pain-free. And if you look at it, uh, uh, these are some other retrospective analyses of open-label open label, long-term studies. The same is true for zolotriptan. You can see those two-hour pain-free response rates treating mild is somewhere on the order of 80%. If you wait until uh, the headache's severe, only about 35% actually become pain-free. It's also true for almatriptan. You can see the, the uh, dose response curve almost. And, uh, and it's not just retrospective data. This was a prospective intervention study looking at uh, pain-free status between at two and four hours. And uh, patients uh, will uh, do much better than uh, by intervening early uh, than, by, than from waiting. So I wanted to uh, show you a little bit more about this uh, concept of allodynia and share with you results from a study that was done by uh, uh, Dr. Burstein and, and his colleague, colleagues in Boston, uh, and where they uh, prospectively identified patients who had cutaneous allodynia with their headaches and then treated them. And uh, this stratified the results according to whether or not they had allodynia or not. And as you can see from this graphic, the patients who had allodynia only had a 15% response rate, and patients who had no allodynia uh, got relief in 93% of cases. So this is, um, it was a small study, but very compelling. It's been difficult to uh, reproduce clinically, but I think it does point to uh, allodynia as being a sign of central sensitization. So if those patients have that, 
uh, sort of, it's almost like an irritability, a pain sensitivity to, to almost anything they do, that's a sign that they're going to uh, be more difficult to, to uh, treat. And then uh, lastly we want to talk about preventing the development of chronic daily headache. And we, we know that uh, patients will uh, develop transformed migraine over time. Sometimes this happens inexplicably, but it's many times uh, associated with the excessive abortive medication overuse. That's why I wanted to put that in this talk to make sure we touched on this concept. And I'm sure you'll hear uh, through some of the other presentations as well. But uh, this is uh, a situation where patients may begin with episodic migraines. The pain is bad when they have them, but they return to a pain-free state in between. And so their interictal levels are uh, in between attacks are, are very normal. And then over time, they start to develop other types of headaches, tension headaches, milder headaches that fill in the gaps in between their migraine attacks. And then over time, they just their, their uh, overall painfulness and headachiness this continues to increase over time to where they're just uh, miserable with chronic headache uh, at all times. And we know that there are, can be several different catalysts for, uh, for this transformation, but uh, very importantly, we see the overuse of acute treatment medications there. The second uh, bullet here is probably the most important thing. And so we have to instruct patients not to use these abortive therapies more than two days per week. It's about eight per month. And so if you have patients that are doing that, uh, we need to educate them and, and uh, think about other prophylactic or non-pharmacologic ways to try to reduce the numbers of headaches that they're having. Um, if they, uh, and another thing that you have to keep in mind is you have to add up to all the different kinds of treatments that the patients are having. So, and, and patients will not tell you about their over-the-counter doses of analgesic combinations that they might use, but you have to make sure you take that history and uh, help uh, help to uh, mitigate against the development of uh, transformed or, or medication overuse headache. And uh, that may be the most important thing that we're trying to accomplish. And we want to return people to normal functioning. One of the most important goals that we want to make sure we support is that uh, prevention of uh, this transformation of episodic migraine into a near daily headache pattern with medication overuse. So in summary, uh, we think that reversal of migraine is best accomplished, accomplished with migraine-specific medications, primarily triptans. Uh, it's best to do it through a patient-centered approach, especially with, you know, to consider the disability that patients have and, and uh, helping them select uh, the treatments to be used, and try to get them to intervene early to improve the effectiveness of the treatments. Uh, and uh, think about central sensitization as, as one of your guiding concepts for how you treat patients. And when, when it's possible, begin that aggressive management before transformation occurs and those patients begin, begin to uh, uh, get medication overuse headache and a much worse quality of life. Thank you for your attention.